What's up? Welcome in Hogue and Johns with you in Orlando at the NFL annual meeting and our annual sit down with head coach of the Chicago Bears, Matt Eberflus, on the show as well. Lots to talk about. Here. Yeah. What do you want to lead with? Well, it's been a busy couple days. Got to talk to Ryan Poles yesterday. Obviously, he had a big quarterback swap. Um, so it was good to hear things in his own words. Had a long conversation with Kevin Warren this morning. Most of that was about the stadium. And then Matt Eberflus also had his breakfast, which we hit on kind of a little bit of everything with him um, this morning. But and why don't George we... George McCaskey later. Yeah, we got George later when they wrap up these meetings and hopefully pass this uh, kickoff rule, um, which will... which. You know, it's pretty much going on this morning, the biggest item. Let's talk stadium, though, to start, because that's kind of fresh in our minds, and I thought it was newsy with Kevin Warren uh, this morning because this is his first, you know, on-the-record comments, really, other than some statements that they put out, making it clear that the lakefront is their focus now. But to hear Kevin Warren talk about it, this is a very, very real thing. It doesn't feel like posturing. It doesn't feel like a hard negotiation tactic with the Arlington Park site. It doesn't feel like that at all. This feels beyond real. Renderings, video, the full financial plan. Kevin Warren said it's all going to be released in the near future. What did he say? Laser focused. The Bears are laser focused now on the the lakefront site. Um, And then there's a whole bunch of reasons why, like the whole idea of building in Chicago, like appeals to Kevin Warren. So I th- this is real. This this is this seems to be happening if the Bears want it to happen. This is this is going to be their their plan going forward. Yeah, and in towards the end of the conversation, I wanted to clarify with him. All right. So all these things come together. And there's a lot that has to come together here if to to be clear, but all that comes together, plans get approved. Is that shovel going in the ground on the lakefront or does Arlington Heights still have a chance here to change their stance, to have a rebuttal, to recruit the Bears back to Arlington Heights. And he made it very clear. No, the shovel would go in the ground. On the lakefront. On the lakefront. And that's on record. So that's that's a big deal to me. Now, there's a lot they still have to figure out. Um, Those renderings are coming. The plans are coming. I can't wait to see them because I asked specifically about the parking, which is a big issue. Um, and <laughs> thinking not, selfishly, yeah, of not just for us, but I mean, it's already hard to get in and out in Sol- out of Soldier Field. Where's the tailgating stuff like that? The fan experience, and they he didn't really have those answers right now. Um, so I'm very curious to see what this all looks like and how realistic it is once those plans come out, and also the money too that they still got to get the public money. But that is a big deal. That if all that does come together. They are going to build the stadium on the lakefront. Yeah, there's a lot of hurdles still, and I'm sure I could see Arlington Heights um, putting out another statement. We've we've been in constant contact with the Chicago Bears, and I'm sure they're going to express some level of optimism. What tells me that this is very serious with the Chicago Bears is they've already met in person with Friends of the Park. That is a significant hurdle to get over just in terms of building things on the lakefront. We, We know... Lucas Museum is out in Chicago because of the Friends of the Park. The Bears have already met with them in person. Kevin Warren explained to, to that to us today. Um, to me, like that's a sign of how real this is for the Chicago Bears, of how like how much Arlington Park might be out of the picture right now in terms of what's next for the stadium. By the way, they might have dodged a bullet with that Lucas Museum. I saw it last week. It's right across from the Coliseum in L.A. It looks like a toilet. <laughs> <laughs> so you, it should have been uh, the Millennium Falcon-like stadium instead? Yeah, I mean, I think that's what they were going for, but maybe it was just the a- the angle I took my photo from the Uber I was in, but I was like, that looks like a toilet. Um, yeah, and and look, I think I, I, I got... I, I will give Kevin Warren credit for this because, look, when Kevin Warren talks, he has big ideas. And if we're being honest, like the some of the things he says, it, it's almost... Like they're so grandiose that sometimes you 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 feel a little tempted to roll your eyes. Like really, like come on. But hearing him talk about this stuff, um, talking about Burnham's vision for the World's Fair, like that would be one of those things where it's like, come on, man. But the thing is, is he actually thinks that way. He really, and, and a couple of times he referenced it today, just like 
I mean, it shouldn't be that hard. Like, someone just needs to really, instead of saying, why can't we do this, just look at it more of, why can't, what, like, why can't we do it? Why, why can't we do it? Yeah. Like, yeah. instead of the reasons why it can't happen, just be like, what about the reasons where, where we can make this happen? Yeah. And that seems to be his approach to this whole thing. And I'm going to give him credit because I, the, the idea of building a new stadium on the lakefront seems so dead in the water when this Arlington Heights thing started coming together. I'm not sure there's another man in the world that could have put this all together in a way where even at this point it seems realistic now when I don't think it did even a couple months ago. No, no. You know, to look, there's so much that Kevin Warren said. You can read it on the theathletic.com. Um, stories up right now as we're recording. Um, CHGO will have it as well. To hear him explain his vision, and like even down to the details of, you know, when we were in Minneapolis building that stadium, we hosted engineering classes you know, as the construction was happening for interested engineering students. Like, how about having classes for, you know, grade school students, you know, on the lakefront campus, you know, to incorporate all the the, the museums and whatnot. And this was a, a vision. Like, when you hear him explain his vision, like, it, it came off to me, like, th- this is what he's telling, like, Mayor Brandon Johnson. This is what he's telling, you know, Governor Pritzker. This is, this is what he's telling the politicians. This is what he's telling friends of the park. This vision, it's not just building a giant stadium. It's how it's incorporated with the lakefront, expanding green spaces. That was an important uh, thing he added. Um, how That's this- why I'm wondering where the concrete is. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm all, I'm all for parks, but like, where's the park? Where do you tailgate? Where maybe it's just open green space for, for, for tailgating. It's it's different. The, the, the renderings for the Arlington Park site. Had a bunch of open green space. Um, you know, it's you know popular now with all new developments and just the the idea. Like this, this struck me. Um, just how many like the lack of cranes and building in Chicago right now, and how that bothers him. Mm-hmm. I feel like that might endear himself to the Chicago business community, to city leaders, just in terms of. $2 billion worth of private Chicago Bears money being pumped in to downtown Chicago. Yeah, and and you can tell that his love for the city um, by living in the city and caring that much about the the money coming into the city, I, it's it's all it's all real. I don't think it's just, you know, him saying things. I mean, I think a part of it is the politics, but also I think it's because he really believes it and he's good at all this. It it to, to me, he seems like he is. So, again, I, um, it, it'll be interesting if they go down this road. I, I'm still obviously a little skeptical that knowing Chicago, that yeah. they'll come together. But I do think that if, if he's so in on this idea and the city, I think, is going to buy into understanding we can't let the Bears leave Chicago. I mean, different mayor. If the mayor, you know, if Brandy Johnson didn't take over, I'm not sure they're in this spot. They probably aren't with everything that Lori Lightfoot said about the team and the, the relationship that was there. So sometimes you need a new team president and a new mayor to come together. Um, and we'll see where this thing goes. And uh, in terms of what happens with Arlington Heights, I kind of liked his answer on that. Well, we're, we're the largest landowner in Arlington Heights. It's good to own land. <laughs> yeah. So we'll, we'll, and they've already we'll cleared the property. You know, they've already yeah. done some of the hard work for the next developer out there. Yeah. So yeah, is is the Arlington Park deal done? Nah, you, you can't say that with finality, but it sure feels like it's like it's almost there, doesn't it? Yeah, and and you know, I'll say more of these feelings is perhaps when it is finalized, but if. I wrote a column a few years ago, back before we even knew the Bears were interested in that property, but it was when Churchill Downs put it up for sale. And, like, Arlington Park is a place where my family spent a lot of time. We used to go on our mother de- Mother's Day every year. Like, going to see the horse races there was a big deal. And I was sad to see that happen. And my whole thing was, but if it does have to happen, this is the perfect opportunity for the Bears to build a new stadium here the same way the Rams did on Hollywood Park in Inglewood, California. And so I don't know what's going to happen to that land, but that is a personal kind of downside for me 
Um, I'm on record. If they can get this thing done on the lakefront, that's where the stadium should be. I got no problems with that. But it is going to kind of suck if that just turns into, like, I don't know, more residential no, 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 no. or another warehouse or something. Hey, Kevin Warren's in charge. You, you got to think big. Coming 2030, McCaskey Racetrack. Okay. <laughs> The McCaskey. Come on. Now <laughs> that's something I definitely cannot have envisioned five years yeah. ago. The McCaskey racetrack. I well then why'd they knock it all down? <laughs> well, it was kind of deteriorating. Um so I don't know. That that seemed that's a big deal. So we'll see where that all goes. Can't wait to see the renderings. Um should we get to Matt Eberflus? Let's do it. All right. Head coach Matt Eberflus sitting down with us. Uh we decided to dim the lights a little bit. <laughs> something like for that. our conversation. <laughs> Uh, with Matt Eberflus. So here he is, the head coach. All right, we got our annual sit down here with Matt Eberflus at the owners meeting. It's not quite as sunny in this room this year as uh, <laughs> some of our past conversations. <laughs> it's kind of <That's> depressing. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we are in Orlando, and I appreciate the time, coach. Yeah, thanks for having me on, and uh, I'm okay with this. This is, this is going to work. Well, you had plenty of time in the sun, right? Two golf trips. Yeah. Down here, yeah, with, with Ryan Poles, a couple eighteen rounds. That you know, we played Bay Hill. That was that was really cool to be able to do that, and then uh, played another course uh, down here. So it was exciting to be able to spend some time together. How much football do you and Ryan talk? Maybe on the golf course? Um, uh, very little. Um, <laughs> really, but, uh, we do have some things that uh, usually it's around seventeen or eighteen. We start talking ball because uh, uh, we usually ride together, which is great, and um, it's it's good to spend time outside of football. You know, we we'll relax and. You know, hit the golf ball and be able to, you know, really uh, work through some things too. You know, we always talk about uh, how we're putting this team together. You know, really physically how we're putting a team together, but also you know, how we bring these guys together relational wise too. Yeah, and you won both rounds, right? Uh, <laughs> I didn't play real good the first. <laughs> one. Uh, the second one I was better. Yeah, the second one I was better. How would you describe the last couple months on your end, uh, on the Bears' end of things, kind of navigating? The waters with Justin Fields. I mean, at this point, you guys have talked a lot about how that you came to that decision, why Pittsburgh was the best spot for him. But I just mean, you know, as you guys went through all these scenarios, and now you're, we saw you last week at USC at the at the pro day. Just how busy it's been, and how tough some of these decisions have been for you. Yeah, it's been it's been since the end of the season, really. You know, you talk about putting a whole new staff together on offense. I think that was important uh, that we took our time uh, during that process. And, and made a good decision um, with Shane and the rest of the offensive staff. So that's number one. And then you start to acquire these players, you know, in free agency. So that's a, that's an important part of it. And working hand-in-hand hand with the coaches and the scouts, you know, we wanted to, when we put this thing together, we wanted to make sure that the scouts and the coaches are working always hand-in-hand hand, uh, to get the best players in here that fit us. And I think we did an excellent job of that uh, this year. Um you know, and then working into the pro days, we've been traveling, looking at these uh, the prospects, the quarterbacks, and all those, and, and it's it's been good. Um, what's great is that on the plane plane ride back, you can always talk about what you saw, what was your opinions, and I think it's important to be able to do that right away. You know, for uh, initial reaction to the workout. How much have you embraced the challenge, I, I guess, of evaluating quarterbacks? You mentioned earlier having that one-on-one -on -one meeting with, with Caleb Williams in, in California. Like, when you're in those interactions, what are you trying to figure out? Like, what are your go-to questions? Like, how are you trying to break through to these guys that so you get the answers that you want? Yeah, uh, first and foremost, you're trying to just get to know them as people. So you really just listen to their journey. You know, I think that's important to be able to sit and listen um, to them, you know, and, and where their support is and, and how do they respond to adversity during those times as they came up you know, in life and in football as well. So um, that's the first thing you do. And then after that, you just really start talking to them about, you know, what we've done here at the Chicago Bears the last couple of years um, with building the foundation. And then, then you start talking ball after that. So you're really looking at those three things, you know, getting to know them, let them know where we are, you know, in terms of year three, um, you know, in our systems and then, and then working really uh, into the football piece of it. You, you coached at the college ranks for a long time before you, got into the NFL. How has the NIL era kind of changed things these last few years? I just, I mean, specifically with Caleb, you look at this guy and like, in some ways he's already a superstar. He's on Dr. Pepper commercials and I think Nissan, like a, 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 that's, that's a different thing to kind of deal with in this draft process. And I'm just curious, like what makes you guys comfortable that, 
you know, the Bears have the infrastructure in place to to handle not just Caleb, but some of these other guys that are coming in with all this stuff already. Yeah, we actually look at it as a positive because uh, he's already ahead of the game, you know, in terms of working through, um, you know, the sponsorships that he has and, and the, all the things that he's working through there. Um, he's already got a, a leg up, so to speak. You know, uh, typically a rookie would come in and uh, they would start that process right there. He's already done that for a couple of years. So I think he's ahead of the game. Um, that way, and really all the guys that, that come in now um, that are high-profile players uh, coming from college. When, when you start talking ball with them, how is that different maybe with you as a defensive coordinator, a defensive coach? Like, how is that back and forth maybe different than Shane, Shane Waldron's conversations with him? Um, I don't think it's any different at all. Football's football, um, and uh, I think we're all talking the same language. You know, so it's, it's going to be important that uh, – the development of all these guys that we bring in, even the free agents. You know, I believe in you know the coaches' jobs is is to develop players and, and and make them better, and helping those guys and partnering with those guys to make them better. I, I couldn't help but notice during uh, a big portion of Caleb's throwing session last week, you were talking to Lincoln Riley. Um, how helpful was that? Just kind of, I guess, in general, you guys probably talk to head coaches all the time. In fact, I know you do. Just how are those conversations valuable to you? And then in particular, that one is you're kind of watching him throw at the same time. I mean, was that fun? Yeah, Lincoln was great uh, during the whole process. Uh, you know, before the workout, the day before, we had a chance to spend about, you know, an hour or so together um, just visiting about everything, you know, because uh, he coached, uh, I think, at Texas Tech and I when I was at Missouri. And uh, But it was, uh, it was great to be able to hear his perspective, you know, on the quarterback and, you know, and on the offense, and I was just trying to get some good information from him, and and they were great to us there. And uh, but during the workout, you know, just kind of just visiting there about, uh, I was asking more about spring ball for him and how he how he implements his offense and how they how they go about uh, uh, installing their their schemes. Caleb threw a punt in there at the end. I mean, can you yeah, can, can you work with that? At, you know, <laughs> we do that at the high school level. Yeah, he actually did that. I think you know a couple of times there, uh, you know, for Lincoln. So, uh, but uh, yeah, he can do a lot of things. Are there certain quarterbacks like you keep in mind when you're evaluating quarterbacks? Like, who, which quarterbacks from your history do you, I guess, hold dear as you start evaluating this draft class? Yeah, the quarterbacks are all different. They really are. So, you know, so all the guys that I was around, you know, Dak Prescott, Tony Romo, you know, Philip Rivers. I mean, you think about those, just naming those three guys, you know. Um, they're just all different, right? But they all they all are effective, and uh, so it's uh, every one of them is different, and uh, I understand that. To me, it's always about the accuracy, and it's always about the ability to move the ball in critical situations. Rookie quarterback versus veteran quarterback. That's I mean that's a big deal uh, in the NFL with with where your roster appears to be, where it's headed. I mean, how much of that was part of your guys' discussion in understanding that, okay, I mean, you guys look like you're ready to win here, but anytime you're bringing a rookie quarterback in, like there's got to be a little bit of a, a feeling out process there before you can really hit the ground running. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be a process of, of, like I said, bringing the team together. So it's important that we do that. You know, it's, we can't skip any steps. we got to pay attention to detail. we got to make sure that we're – we're, we're, we're crossing every T, dotting every I, and making sure we're doing that. And that's an important part. You know, me as the head football coach and the coordinators, we got we got to pull that off, offense, defense, and kicking. Um, you know, so this it's critical, these 10 weeks coming into the offseason, uh, before we get to the summer break, um, that we do a great job of laying the foundation for our, our 2024 football. What are you going to draw from, I guess, your relationship with, with Justin, just in terms of building – a new relationship, whether that's Caleb or another quarterback that you guys draft first or overall, like what can you take from those moments, those moments at the breakfast club that you can carry over to the next quarterback? Yeah, it's, it's just, like I said, it was about being authentic and, and being real and, and, and just being open and, and communicating well. And that's, that's, you know, cause there's a lot of things that every player has to deal with. You know, you have to deal with your, your performance, you know, how, how did you perform that day? Is it good? Yep. And there's things that you need to work on and improve and, you need to partner with your coach to be able to, to make that improvement. Um, if you keep it right there, um, I think it's it's pretty easy. Um, but you know, we also understand that adversity happens and how you're going to respond to that. So um, it's going to be a process of that. Um, you know, talking with uh, you know all the rookies doesn't matter if it's the first pick, you know, or the 75th pick or the ninth. So um, it's going to be important that we do that. 
Is there a best way to challenge a quarterback? Maybe that you've learned over the years, maybe on, on the field, but also like as a head coach. Yeah, I I I do think that you can challenge them, um, you know, for sure. But I also know that the great ones challenge themselves. You know, every single day they really get after it. Um, if they have some adversity, they always respond. Um, and they're alpha competitors. All, all the really good ones I've been around are, are that way. You know, they have a tough day, man. They come right back at you. And, uh, you know, they're always going to be in that spot. They know they're apex of the offense. And uh, it's important that uh, you support them as a head coach. Um, and it's important that the whole team supports uh, that position. What do you like most about where your defensive identity is right now, you know, two plus years into this and how it's come along? Yeah, it's it's been good. Um you know, the first year we, you know, obviously with the whole football team, we did a good job of laying the foundation, how we play, you know, the, the physical style. Um, and then last year I thought we did a good job of, uh, you know, the run defense, you know, was was, was good. You know, the, the takeaways was was in a positive, you know, going down the stretch. Um, and you got to continue that. You know, we have to continue that, you know, but it's really about the players, you know, the, the you know, Tremaine and TJ and, you know, Tez and, you know, Jalen and Tyreek and, you know, Jaquan, you know, all those guys that, that, you know, we got the young tackles. Uh, so we're in, we're in a good spot, you know, we're, we're in a good spot and uh, it's important that we, you know, you know, do the work, you know, and put our best foot forward. Does, does Jalen Johnson kind of embody this process that's been going on the last two years? Cause he's been vocal in some of his interviews about like, man, this hits thing when I first got here, you know, trying to battle <laughs> through all that. Yeah. But obviously he's gotten to the point that you guys rewarded him with it, with an extension and, and, and he's obviously a huge focal part. Yeah. Focal point of the yeah, whole. He's team. been he's been great uh, since we've been together, and uh, he's he's done it. Respectful, hard worker, um, you know, first guy in, last guy to leave, leave, and he's done a wonderful job of leading that. Not only the secondary, the defense, but now he's starting to lead the football team, and uh, we're excited to have him. How would you characterize maybe the the field, the momentum you think was established, especially over like the second half of the season, and maybe like how the, the players maybe sense what's coming for the defense. Like, you know what I'm getting at? Like, feel, good things feel very much on the horizon for your defense, like better things than last year. Like, how do you feel that? Yeah, I, I really feel that, uh, you know, we got to do it again uh, this year. You know, we got to have a fast start, you know, to uh, to that unit, uh, to our offensive unit, and to really the whole football team. And uh, it's important that we do that. Um, you know, we didn't accomplish that last year, and we got to do a, a really good job of making sure that we have a great um, 10 weeks in, the, in this offseason in the spring, and then guys really build this thing up to make sure they're they're in the best shape of their life going into training camp and then, you know, working through, you know, the Hall of Fame game and, and all those things and, and then uh, making sure we're going through that process. We've talked so much about quarterbacks, but how much time are you putting into these pass rushers who could be available at number nine? Yeah, we're going to spend time on all of them. You know, the pass rushers, uh, be it inside or outside, uh, we're going to we're going to look at that, and then we're going to make sure we're doing a great job of the receivers and the tackles and all those premium positions that that you could take there. Um, and it's uh, it's going to be a great process. But I know Ryan and I are excited to get going. All right, you know I got to talk some special teams with you. Um, with this, as we're recording this right now, there's a vote that's about to come up on the kickoff rule. So we don't necessarily know what's going to happen as we're recording this, but let's just talk in, as if this thing is happening this season. How excited are you just as a coach to to, to work into the strategy uh, of what that play can possibly be and hopefully what is the return of the kick return into the football game because it's really just diminished into almost a non-factor. Yeah. Yeah, and really, the the thing that the, the league is is trying to do, and and I support it, is that bring that that play back. You know, it's an exciting play. Uh, Devin Hester wouldn't be in the Hall of Fame if we had the play the, the play as it is, sits right now. So we have to bring the play back, and I think it's a it's a unique way that we're doing it. Um, but I'm excited about being able to look at the scheme and to see how we can you know either you know the cover part of it and also the return part of it. So HT and I will work uh, hand in hand together in that, and uh, I'm excited about getting that process going. It, Coach Hightower has been such a big part of, of pushing this. Um, I know he was down here too at, at the meetings. Uh, just, I mean, you feel like he got a, he has a leg up on this since he's been such a big part of, of tr trying to convince the competition committee that this is the way the league should go. Yeah, Coach Hightower is 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 really good at, um, at what he does, and uh, it, it is an exciting time because this is a new play. I know that all the special teams guys are excited about it, and uh, we feel that it'll pass. We'll see, 
Um, but uh, HT has done a wonderful job of really presenting this to the league and adjusting it, you know, with the special teams coaches. You know, the uh, Roger Goodell and those guys asked HT to come in and really, um, you know, spearhead this thing with a couple other uh, special teams coaches, and uh, he's done a wonderful job with that. Is your special teams segment done now? I'm excited. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I kind of want to do it at the high school level just so we can start scheming for this, but that's not going to happen. All right, last <laughs> last one. Um, you can't get out of here without talking about – I guess your, your your new look. We talked about it a little bit <laughs> yeah. at breakfast. Um, we know the, your girls are, are behind at Lawrence Funk at House Hall, but like, have you like noticed? Have they told you about the buzz about it on, on social media and whatnot? Yeah, I don't have social media, <laughs> but my my girls do, so they'll they'll send me some stuff once in a while. But it, uh, I think it's fun. I mean, it's uh, it's lighthearted and it, it's good. And uh, as long as they like it, I'm good with it. What have the players said so far? Uh, Jaquan said something that he's like, <laughs> yeah. Coach, that's fire. You got to keep it. You know, so, so I was like, Okay, that's fine. Well, Coach, we yeah, we've we like the look. Uh, I know our listeners, viewers do too. And uh, thank you so much for sitting down with us again. Right, we man. appreciate it. We'll let you get to this vote. Okay, man. Right. Thank you. Appreciate okay. it. Okay, truth be told, we figured out the lights after <laughs> the Matt Eberflus interview. Our friend Herb Howard, who is here with us, uh, he touched the right button. <laughs> It makes sense because, you know, we were in a different room yesterday with Ryan Poles and it was brighter. And I'm like, why can't we? But you know what? No, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to throw anybody under the bus. Fox 32. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jeff Weirs from Fox 32. I would have trusted you a little bit more with the lighting. But he had his own light. So maybe he was sabotaging us. It's true. Maybe that's what was happening. Yeah. yeah. I, I, you know, anyway, I hope you we dim the lights a little bit for Flues. Uh, back on with the bright lights now. And we have an update because since we wrapped up the recording of that interview, uh, as Flus indicated, and he was going literally straight out of this interview to go vote on that kickoff rule, and it did pass. So the, uh, that optimism he had about it uh, was real. It's a one-year trial basis. There is an XFL kickoff in the NFL for one year. You know I'm excited about it. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, fine. <laughs> we could talk special teams for a little bit. You, you know, Nicholas Moriano put this a good way. I was kidding. Yesterday. <laughs> I know you were. It, when Devin Hester was on the Bears, it was like, to me, that was like Frank Thomas coming to a bat four times a game. Like, you didn't want to miss it. When there was a kick return, you, you, you weren't going to turn your teeth. You weren't going to the bathroom. If you were in the stadium, you weren't going to go to the concessions at that point. It was like the must-see moments of the game. that The kickoff has become where now when you go to the bathroom. Yeah. That's yeah. when you, you like, well, if, I, if you're I, in the I, press box, you know if there's a touchdown scored, you have enough time to run to the bathroom down the hall at Soldier Field and get back in time. You, you, you might have missed a kickoff, but you didn't really miss anything because it's first down. Well, first, this is the first time I think I've ever heard anyone compare Devin Hester to the Big Hurt. <laughs> right. Herb Howard. Herb. Herb. Right. That analogy made sense, right? To, it's baseball. You only get four like bats a game. Ten percent of the baseball fans. Is, <laughs> I know he's a Hall of Fame player. I, I get it. Uh, two. They're both Hall of Famers. It, damn it! Now, like when I used to like, I have a, a couple um, very long Devin Hester stories out there, like including in, in, in a book that I wrote, and like even when Devin Hester was in the league, like Devin Hester was so special. Like, of course, he was must-watch television. But all the other guys, it was still the bathroom break time. You would still use it. But it's I like that the that football play is now back in football. Yeah. There's just so many touchbacks now. And the, the Bears actually have one of the best touchback kickers in the, in the league. But just to have one of the most exciting, one of the most, I don't know, unpredictable football plays back into the game. I like it. Herb, is Velas Jones a lock to make the team now? Running back. It's exciting, man. It's, it's, a, it's a variable in the game that's been gone. Right? Mm. Yeah. So, yeah, hopefully people can hear that. He's uh, just mad about our Frank Thomas. Yeah, I don't know. I threw, him off. I threw him off with that one. <laughs> there you go. Sammy Sosa, Sammy Sosa was must wa must watch that. Define. I'm with him. Yeah, you know steroids and all. Mark McGuire. Hey, save baseball. Mark McGuire, man. I watched every one of those at bats in '98. Baseball. Hey, don't tell Gordon Wintmire that he once nearly killed me for saying that he saved baseball. Not literally, but it was a it was a debate. Um, David Kaplan might have been involved too. No, you can imagine. Yeah. 
All right. Well, I'm excited about the kickoff. I'm excited about the stadium. I hope it does happen for Chicago. I mean, the idea that Chicago could have a Super Bowl and you don't have to go to Arlington Heights to get out there when you know everything else would be downtown Super Bowl week. Um, we're a long ways off. Yeah. We'll see where that all goes. And we really haven't talked about Caleb Williams much. Yeah, I was about to say, we can't get out here with at least two minutes on Caleb Williams. Um, the feedback has been outstanding. Yeah. Outstanding. That's that's from Ryan Poles himself. Um, he kind of ca- he caught you a little bit. And he goes, they just they, they don't like him. They love him. Like there was like a pause yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, I think. Uh, yesterday when we when we talked to Ryan Poles, um, Matt Eberflus had a very positive interaction with him the day before his pro day. Uh, Kevin Warren um, tried to talk around the Caleb Williams questions a little bit, but he's he's met Caleb Williams himself at the combine. Yeah, and there there was one thing from the Flus interview that we just had that that did kind of stick with me, and that was when I asked him about the NIL stuff, and because I am really curious about. Caleb Williams is coming into the Bears as a much bigger superstar than most of you know the guys you ever draft. Mitch Trubisky, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> not and, even the same, the same but, but, stratosphere of things. I mean, he's literally in commercials everywhere, and so many people have tried to paint this business stuff as a negative for him. Um, and it's very interesting, like, oh, he doesn't care about football. He's got all these other interests and, and, you know, the dad and all this stuff, like it's a big negative. And it's according to the bears who I also give him credit. They're not shying away from talking about this. No, I mean, that's another thing about this. You don't usually have, I, I would say they've embraced it. I'm not even sure the NFL loves how much they've talked about it. They've definitely embraced it. Um, but they, first of all, a, he loves football. They're making that very clear. They have no issues with him with his teammates. They're making that very clear. And in terms of this business stuff, as some type of a distraction, as Flew said in that interview, they look at it as a positive. Because the, the biggest thing that is so hard, you could vet a prospect as much as possible. Great guy, great teammate, whatever. You never know how these guys are going to react until they get that first paycheck. Life changes so much. It's just human nature. It's It goes from something you did in college as an amateur to now you're getting paid for it. Now it's your full-time job, and now you get that big paycheck, especially for these first-rounders who get more of the money. It, it's going to change anybody. You know, it would change us if yeah. we ever uh, were, you well, know, yeah. were able to get paid like that, which we never will. But... Caleb Williams already there. He made ten million dollars last yep. year. Like they already know how he handles all this. That to me, that's a huge advantage. I think it's revealing. It also reveals a lot about the people he has around him, just in terms of the advice he gets. Just like the, honestly, I don't think some of the things have been portrayed negatively. It seems like it's more positive, if anything, just in terms of the structure they've built around him to where he can focus on football and not be so engaged in his commercials with Nissan at, at the Heisman house and, and whatnot. And, and like, here's the thing, like I think bears fans who are critical of Caleb Williams have to understand, like if he's a superstar quarterback, he's going to be in commercials. <laughs> like this, this is all kind of new for us, but like, this is beyond like Dunkin' Donuts billboards. This is like SNL. It's, you know, discount double checks and things like that. Like, it's Peyton Manning who is on every commercial uh, imaginable. Like, this is what happens when you have a superstar quarterback. You know, there's Hollywood girlfriends and whatnot. This is what happens when your quarterback is good. I th- like, good, good. Yeah, I think the probably the best comp I can come up with off the top of my head for somebody who would get that type of stuff so early in their career. Because even with Peyton Manning, I think it took some time. If I'm, I mean, I guess I can't remember 98 that well. Um, Baker Mayfield? Baker Mayfield got thrown into a lot of commercials yep. right away. They were great commercials, too. And by the way, I... I, I, I am in full support of the progressive ads coming yeah, back. Yeah, they need to come back. Yeah, those are hilarious. He threw for over 4,000 yards last He's year. He's got a new deal. New stadium to call home, though. Let's go. Yeah, yeah. well, that's fine. Um, it's probably a better stadium they can do yeah. those ads. I, I, It'll be interesting to see how much of that takes off right away with him as a rookie. But the point being, it shouldn't be that big of a distraction because he's already used to all this stuff. He's so, been through it. Yeah. All right. Any other final thoughts? No. Before no. We, leave? we got another big show coming yeah. Friday. Maybe talk a little bit more football. 
Yeah. football We'll uh, We'll wrap up anything George McCaskey has to say later today. Um, and our show Friday is going to be a crossover. Oh, Bears Hall of Fame game. Oh, yeah. We knew that. Yeah. We kind of already knew that, but they did officially announce it. August 1st, um, training camp's going to start a week early. It's going to be kind of a different offseason there. Um, so the Bears are going to have four preseason games. And uh, But Friday's episode, we're going to be talking to Robert Mays and Nate Tice. Crossover with the athletic football show. Excited about that, so we'll get their take on everything and anything else that we didn't cover in this episode. But always good to talk to Flus. Always the new Flus. New Flus. No. Oh. Yeah, yeah. No, he's the yeah. new Flus. New it's new Flus. It's next next gen Flus. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. All right. Uh, follow us at Adam Hogue, at Adam Johns, there you at go. Hogan Johns. Now Hogan Johns like Twitter account just it trips me up. We gotta say our names too many times. Also follow Herb Howard who's sitting here at Herb Howard because he's the best. Even though people think we hate each other now. I'm <laughs> <laughs> I need more Herb coffee. Wants to, Herb wants some coffee. <laughs> John's needs some too. I don't know how I have energy right now, but um, maybe it's just the new kickoff rule. We're out of here. We'll talk to you Friday, and uh, it should be a fun episode with Robert Mays and Nate Tice. See ya. Nothing's off the table. Nothing is on the table right now.